In this video, I'll be going through the 2021 scholarship physics paper. Question 1. A research nuclear reactor is designed to produce a beam of neutrons. The neutrons are produced by fission of uranium, with one of several possible reactions being described by the following equation, in which we have our neutron colliding with our uranium-235, and as a result we get our barium-141, krypton-92, and three neutrons. The neutrons released in these reactions have a wide range of energies, but can be slowed down by passing them through material of similar nuclear mass to form a beam of slow neutrons. Use the concept of binding energy to explain why fission reactions occur. The key concept here is the average binding energy per nucleon. This binding energy is going to be lower for our uranium than it is for our barium and krypton, meaning that the nucleons in barium and krypton are more bound and therefore have a lower energy. Lower energy means more stable and also more favorable to the universe. As a general rule, objects in the universe will tend towards a lower energy state, such as a ball at the top of the hill, tending towards areas of lower potential energy. And since we're moving to a state of lower energy, we must have some energy left over, which is manifested as the kinetic energy of the daughter particles. The uranium-235 divides into 141 barium and 92 krypton, which have a higher average binding energy per nucleon. They are therefore more stable and energetically favorable. This higher binding energy leaves an excess of energy, which manifests as kinetic energy. Particles such as neutrons also behave as if they have a wavelength given by lambda equals h over p, where h is Planck's constant and p is the momentum of the particle. Show that the wavelength of a slow neutron with a kinetic energy of 0.0400 electron volts is 1.43 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. And so as stated above our equation for wavelength, the de Broglie equation is this one here. And while we do know Planck's constant above, we don't know the momentum. But what we do know is that momentum is equal to mass times velocity, where we do know the mass of the neutron, but we don't know the velocity. What we do know, however, is the kinetic energy, which is given by this equation here. Solving that for our velocity, and now putting in our numbers, where our energy is 0.04 times an electron volt, and to convert an electron volt into a joule, we just need to multiply this by the charge of an electron, which we are given above. The mass of a neutron is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27. And that gives me 2,770 meters per second to three significant figures. Using that to find our momentum, gives me 4.63 times 10 to the minus 24 kg meters per second, and finally using our h over p equation. And that indeed gives me 1.43 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, which is what we're trying to find. Neutrons of energy 0.0400 electron volts can diffract from planes of atoms in crystalline copper of spacing d equals 2.20 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, as shown below. By first considering the path difference for neutrons scattered from adjacent planes, show that a diffraction peak will be observed at angle 19 degrees. First of all, we know our path difference is going to be our d sine theta plus our d sine theta, or 2d sine theta. We also know that at our peak diffraction, our path difference is going to equal our wavelength, so that we have our first instance of constructive interference. And we know from our question earlier that our wavelength is our 1.43 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. So our path difference is 2d sine theta, and is also equal to our lambda. All we need to do now is solve this for theta. 
First of all, we'll divide both sides by 2D. And now take the inverse sine. Putting our numbers in. Which indeed gives me 19.0 degrees to three significant figures. Neutrons have mass, but zero charge. A neutron with kinetic energy 0.0400 electron volts is initially traveling horizontally. Calculate the vertical deflection of the neutron due to gravity as it travels a horizontal distance of 1.00 times 10 to the 2 meters. This is a very straightforward kinematics question. We will need to pick our kinematics equation, which we'll use for the vertical motion, since we're interested in the vertical deflection. The one we'll choose is the one without the final velocity, since we don't know that and we have no interest in it. That equation is this one here. But since we know it's traveling horizontally initially, we know that the initial vertical velocity is going to be zero, so we can just forget this term here. Now we know the acceleration due to gravity, but we don't know the time. To find this, we can use our old trusty V equals D over T, where this time we're looking at the horizontal motion, we know that it travels a distance of 1.00 times 10 to the 2 meters at a particular velocity, which we happened to find earlier, in a particular time, which is the same time for the vertical motion. Solving that for t, putting our numbers in, and our velocity that we found earlier is our 2770. That gives me 0.0361 seconds, two three significant figures, and now we can put numbers into our final equation. Which gives me 6.39 times 10 to the minus three meters, two three significant figures. Explain whether or not a uniform electric field can be used to compensate for the effect of gravity on the neutron. Quite simply, no. A neutron has no charge and will therefore not experience a force due to the electric field. Question two, a typical guitar has six strings. Two of these strings are tuned in the notes A and D. When tuned correctly, the A string has a fundamental frequency of 110 Hertz, and the fourth harmonic of the A string has the same frequency as the third harmonic of the D string. Explain how the principle of beats can be used to determine if the D string is at the correct frequency, if it is known that the A string already has the correct fundamental frequency of 110 Hertz. Recall that beats are produced when two frequencies are played that are different. That means if we play the fourth harmonic of our A string, as well as the third harmonic of our D string at the same time, if they were the same, we'd expect to hear no beats. If they were different, then we would. The fourth harmonic of the A string could be played at the same time as the third harmonic of the D string. If the D string is in tune, the frequencies will be the same, and no beats would be produced. Calculate the fundamental frequency of the D string when it is correctly tuned. Once again, we know that the fourth harmonic of the A string should be the same as the third harmonic of the D string. The frequency of the fourth harmonic of the A string is going to be four times the fundamental frequency of the A string, which is three times the fundamental frequency of the D string. Given that we know that the fundamental frequency of the A string is our 110, we just need to solve this equation for Fd. To do this, I'll divide both sides by three and swap them around. Which gives me 146.7 Hertz to four significant figures because that's what we're given our frequency here to. Some guitars use a set of three identical springs to apply tension to the strings. The three springs all have a spring constant K and an unstretched length L0. They are then stretched and connected between the bottom side of a pivoted metal plate called the bridge and a fixed spring plate as shown. Show that the net force F applied to the bridge by the three stretched springs is given by this fat equation here. What I'm going to do is separate our springs into our middle spring and our two outer springs. Because symmetry, we can expect that these two are going to be the same. 
For our middle spring, well, we of course know that f equals kx, ignoring the negative since we're only worried about the magnitude. The x in this case being the extension, which since we know that the unstretched length of our spring is our l naught, and that our stretched length is our l, this distance here is our extension, which is l minus l naught. Let's now think about our outer spring. Now, as before, our force is just our kx, but our x is going to be a little bit more than our l minus l naught, because being on an angle means that the spring has been stretched longer. To figure out how much, we're going to need to turn to trigonometry. Let's imagine our triangle here, where we have our right angle right there, and of course our angle right here. Our base length is of course our l, and the total length of our spring is going to be the unstretched length, plus whatever extension we have. That x is what we're wanting to find an expression for. For that, we can turn to Sokotoa, and given that we have got the adjacent here, and the hypotenuse, that's of course going to be ka. That is that cosine of our angle is equal to our adjacent, l, divided by our hypotenuse, l naught plus x. We can solve this for x by first of all swapping our cosine theta with our l naught plus x, and now subtracting l naught from both sides. What that means is that our final force here is just our x expression multiplied through by our k. So we've found the total force applied by our outside spring. However, the component of this force that goes into our final force on the bridge here is entirely our horizontal component. Our vertical components of these forces are going to be opposing each other and cancelling out. So the horizontal component of our outside spring is going to be this force here, our total force, multiplied by cosine of the angle. We can simplify this down by multiplying our cosine theta through. Finally, we're ready to add our two forces together. So our total bridge force is going to be the force of our middle spring, plus two times our outside spring force, since we have two of those. Now we just need to do some algebra magic to get it looking like this. Let's first expand out. Since these are like terms here, we can add those together. And these two here have the common factor of L0, so we can factorize that out. Factorizing out at k, we arrive at precisely what we're trying to find. The bridge is where the strings connect to the body of the guitar. Some guitars have a floating bridge design, where the springs are attached to the bottom, and the strings to the top of the pivoted bridge as shown below. The speed of a transverse wave in a string is given by this equation here, where t is the tension in the string, and mu is the linear density of the string. Assuming that all strings have equal tension t and length z, show that the fundamental frequency of a string is given by this horrific equation here. So we're going to have a few things going on. In the last question, we found the force that our springs are exerting on the bridge. This force is going to induce a torque, which is given by our force times the distance, d2. The force in question is going to be six times the tension on any one string, given that there are six strings, such that our torque from our strings is going to be the force times our distance d1, which is going to be our 6t d1. We can use this to find our tension, knowing that our torques are equal, the torque on our spring being our force times our distance 2, and on our strings being our 6t d1. Solving that for our tension by dividing both sides by 6 d1, where our force is the force we found in the last question, which is this one here. 
We can substitute that in later since it looks like it's kept intact in this equation that we're trying to show. Now we're given this equation here, which has our tension, which we can substitute in, but it doesn't have our frequency. So we need to plug that in somehow. Our obvious point of entry is our V here. We know the equation V equals F lambda, and we also know that we're looking for the fundamental frequency. For a wave on a string, the fundamental frequency has a harmonic that looks like this, where the wavelength is twice this distance. What we have here is half a wave, of which we need two to make a full wave. For our distance, we have the letter Z. So our wavelength is 2Z. Substituting that in, we get V equals 2ZF. Let's now put that into our equation here, as well as our tension. Solving this for our frequency, I'm first going to square both sides. And now divide both sides by 2 squared z squared, 2 squared just being our 4. Where our 4 and our 6 make 24. Square rooting both sides. And now substituting in our f, and also rearranging the denominator to match our final solution. which matches up perfectly with what we're trying to find here. If the D string on a guitar with a floating bridge snaps, explain how the fundamental frequency of the A string will be affected and state the new fundamental frequency of the A string. Assume that the string length Z is constant. From our equation above, we know that the velocity is equal to the square root of our tension force divided by mu. And we also know that our velocity is the frequency times wavelength. Since we know that our z is constant, that means our wavelength must be constant, and also that our mu, our linear density of the string, must also be constant. And so given that these two don't change, our frequency must be proportional to the square root of our tension. And our tension initially was just our force on our bridge divided by our six strings. But now since one of those strings has broken, it is now being divided over five strings. So we're going to see an increase in the tension in proportion to TF over TI. Substituting those in, our Fs cancel out, giving us six over five. And so if our tension increases by a factor of six, over 5, and our frequency is proportional to the square root of tension, then our frequency is going to increase by proportion of the square root of 6 over 5, meaning that our new fundamental frequency is going to be the square root of 6 over 5 times the old fundamental frequency. Our old fundamental frequency is our 110 hertz given all the way up here. giving me 120.5 Hz to four significant figures. And so that is our calculation, but we're also asked for an explanation. The force applied to the strings is now spread over five strings instead of six. This results in an increase in tension on each string, which increases the wave speed, V equals the square root of tension over mu, as mu is constant, which increases the frequency, V equals frequency times lambda, as z and therefore lambda are constant. Question 3. We're given this nice trigonometric relationship here, I'm sure that will come in handy. A ball with mass m is launched at a speed v at an angle theta to the horizontal as shown. The projectile lands at the same height that it was launched from. The horizontal distance travelled d is maximum when theta equals 45 degrees. By considering components of the velocity v, show that the maximum horizontal distance travelled d is given by d equals v squared over g. Assume that drag is negligible for this part of the question. So we're essentially just looking at a kinematics problem with a bit of extra trig and substitution. 
As the question suggests, I'm going to approach this by considering the components of the velocity, the horizontal and vertical. Since we're wanting to find the maximum horizontal distance, I'll start with horizontal and then see what substitutions we need to make. Since there is no acceleration in the horizontal direction, our horizontal velocity, Vx, is just our distance over time. But knowing a bit of trigonometry, if we have our velocity v, then our horizontal component is going to be v cosine theta, and our vertical is going to be v sine theta. So we can also write this as equal to v cosine theta. Now that gives us a good start to find our horizontal distance equation. But we see we have our variable t, which we don't have in our final equation, so we need to find some way to substitute that out. To do so, we can look at the vertical motion. Now, to find a relationship for our time, we can do what we have to do in a number of these kinematic problems. Consider the ball starting with some initial velocity, and then rising to its peak, where our final velocity is equal to zero. The time required for that to happen is just half our overall time. So we can find that time and then just double it to find the overall. So we have a ball with some initial velocity, an initial velocity that's equal to v sine theta, our vertical component. It finishes off with a final velocity in a certain time and we also know that the acceleration is going to be gravitational and has to make an appearance in our final equation. What we don't know and don't care about is our vertical distance, so we'll choose the one kinematic equation without distance, which is this one here. Now since our initial velocity and our gravity are in opposite directions, we can change this to a minus. And now solving for t half gives us the initial velocity over g, which means our final time is double that where our vi is v sine theta. Substituting this in over here, where our g being in the denominator of a denominator just moves up into the numerator. Solving this for d by multiplying both sides by 2v sine theta, and then dividing both sides by g, we can now use the relationship given above, this one here. So we can replace our 2 sine theta cosine theta with sine 2 theta. And now since our theta is our 45 degrees from up here, that means our sine of 2 theta is just sine of 90 which is just one, leaving us with v squared over g, which is exactly what we're trying to find. A more accurate model of the situation includes a drag force f that acts on the ball. This force changes the motion of the ball as it moves through the air. A simple assumption would be that the drag force f is constant in magnitude and acts only in the horizontal direction as the ball moves through the air as shown. Show that in the case of a constant horizontal drag force f, the horizontal distance traveled d by a ball launched at speed v at an angle theta to the horizontal is given by the expression this one here. For this we need a horizontal distance equation that accounts for an acceleration. Recall in the last question we assumed that there wasn't any. For that we can use this equation here, minus the effect of our acceleration, half at squared. Now looking at our final equation here, I can see that we don't have a term for the acceleration, but we do have our f and our m. So if you recall that our force equals mass times acceleration, that also means that our acceleration is equal to our force divided by mass. So we can make that substitution. We also don't have our initial velocity, which is our initial horizontal velocity but we do know that that equals v cosine theta. So we can make that substitution as well. Now we also don't have a time in our final equation, but we did find an equation for time in our last question. This one right here. So let's make that substitution. 
We can do some extra rearranging here, combining our V terms here for V squared. Simplifying four over two into just two. Factorizing out V squared over G, and also seeing over here that we have two sine theta cosine theta, which via the rule up here, we can just replace with sine two theta. giving us exactly what we're trying to find. Discuss the validity of the assumptions about the drag force in part B. Describe more realistic assumptions about the drag force, and explain how these would affect the horizontal distance travelled by the ball. We indeed did make a couple of very bold assumptions. The first one was that the drag force was constant, when in fact we'd expect it to increase with the velocity. Rather than being constant, drag force increases with velocity. Another assumption we made is that the drag force only acts in the horizontal direction, when in fact it must also act in the vertical direction. Rather than only acting horizontally, drag force will also oppose the vertical velocity, causing the ball to reach a lower height, reducing flight time and horizontal distance travelled. And now in the other direction, because we know that drag force increases with velocity, and that the horizontal velocity decreases because of the drag force, we know that the drag force itself must decrease, which will act to lengthen the horizontal distance travelled. However, since horizontal velocity decreases, so too must the horizontal drag force, resulting in a higher horizontal velocity than might be expected, and potentially acting to increase the horizontal distance travelled. After receiving an initial push, the solid ball begins rolling up a slope as shown on the right. The ball has a mass m, radius r, and moment of inertia i equals 2 fifths mr squared. When it is at height 0, the centre of mass of the ball has velocity vi. When it has reached height h, the centre of mass of the ball has velocity v. Assuming that the drag is negligible in this situation, show that the velocity of the centre of mass of the ball v, when it has reached height h, is given by this equation here. Given all we know, I predict the best lens here is going to be energy. So let's plot out the energy before and the energy after. We're going to have kinetic energy, we're going to have rotational kinetic energy, and we're also going to have gravitational potential energy. Let's first look at the energy before. We have our linear kinetic energy, we have our rotational kinetic energy, and then afterwards we have our kinetic energy once again, this time with our V instead of VI, as well as our rotational kinetic energy, and also some gravitational potential energy. Where I'm using the initial velocity as VI, the initial rotational velocity as omega i, and the final velocity as V, and the final rotational velocity as just omega. Just to be clear. Problem is, we don't have omegas in our final equation here. So we need to substitute them out. Now what we do know is that velocity is equal to r omega, and so that omega is equal to our velocity over our radius, where in this case our radius is capital R. So we know that our omega i must equal our vi over r, and we know that our omega must equal our v over r. So let's make that substitution, and also the substitution for our rotational inertia here. To make things a bit better looking, we can multiply everything by 2 to get rid of all of our halves, leaving us with just a 2mgh here. And we can also divide everything by m, which will eliminate that out of our equation entirely, which is good because it's not in this one. We can also cancel out our r squared over r squareds here. Now we know that vi squared plus 2 fifths vi squared is going to give us 7 fifths vi squared, just basic fractions there. And the same for our v over here. And now let's just solve this for our v. 
I'm first going to swap the sides around and subtract 2GH from both sides. Next I'm going to multiply both sides by 5 and divide by 7. We are our 2 and our 5, just give us 10. And finally I'm going to square root both sides. Giving us exactly what we're trying to find. Give an expression for the maximum height reached by the ball as it rolls up the ramp. Well, we know at the maximum height, our velocity is going to equal zero. So let's take our equation from up here and just see what happens. Squaring both sides to get rid of our square root. Adding 10gh over seven to both sides. And finally, dividing both sides by 10g and multiplying by seven which I think is about as good as we're going to get. Question four. A parallel circuit is connected to a 1.10 times 10 to the two volt DC supply and a switch as shown. One branch of the circuit has a 22.4 ohm resistor, R1, and an uncharged capacitor C in series. The other branch has only a 27.5 ohm resistor, R2. Sketch clearly labelled lines slash curves on the axes on the right to show how the voltage across each component, R1, R2 and the capacitor C, will change when the switch is closed at T equals zero seconds. Explain why the voltage across each component changes in this way. We'll start with R2 since it is the simplest to explain. Since it is wired in parallel with our voltage supply, it will receive that constant supply of 110 volts. R2 is in parallel with the 110 volt source, so its voltage will be a constant 110 volts. Let's now look at our capacitor. Now our capacitor voltage is going to start at zero and then work its way up to our 110 volts as it charges up. The rate of voltage change is going to be faster initially, but then slow down as the plates become charged and increasingly repel incoming charges. The capacitor voltage increases from 0 volts to 110 volts as it charges rapidly initially, then gradually slower as the increasingly charged plates increasingly repel incoming charges. Let's now consider our resistor R1. Initially when our switch is closed, the current through this branch here is going to be at a maximum, but then as our capacitor charges up, that current is going to go to 0. Since the voltage across this resistor is proportional to the current, V equals IR, we're going to see the voltage of the resistor decrease to zero from an initial voltage of 110. Why 110? Because if you think back to Kirchhoff's voltage law, if we consider this loop here, our source voltage of 110 volts must equal our resistor voltage, R1, plus the voltage in our capacitor. And so if the voltage in our capacitor is initially at zero, that means R1 must be 110, and vice versa at the end here. So we're essentially going to see an opposite trend to that of C. Since the capacitor voltage and resistor one voltage must add to 110 volts, the voltage across R1 must initially be 110 volts as the capacitor voltage is zero. Once the capacitor is charged and has a voltage of 110 volts, no current flows through that branch, and the voltage across R1 is zero. The capacitor is removed from the circuit and replaced with a non-ideal inductor. The non-ideal inductor has both inductance L and internal resistance R. At T equals zero seconds, the switch is closed. The voltage across each component, R1, R2, and L, is measured for three seconds and plotted on the graph on the facing page. Using physics principles, explain why each of the three lines on the graph has the shape it does. As before, we'll start with the easiest to explain, and that is R2, which once again is in parallel with our source voltage and therefore constantly experiences our source voltage. R2 is still in parallel with the 110 volt source, so experiences a constant 110 volts. 
Let's now talk about our inductor. As you hopefully recall, inductors produce a voltage when the current through them is changing. So our voltage across our inductor is going to be proportional to the change in current, which is large initially, and then eventually as our current stops changing, the back EMF produced becomes zero, and we're only left with a voltage due to our internal resistance, which we can see is our 10 volts. The inductor voltage is large initially, as it produces a back EMF in response to the current change. This reduces to zero as the current reaches a constant value, leaving a 10 volt drop due to the internal resistance. Lastly, we can talk about our R1. As before, the voltage through R1 is just going to be proportional to our current. The current initially is lower because of our back EMF produced by our inductor, but then eventually as our back EMF disappears, our current reaches its maximum value, as does our R1 voltage, which is 100 volts, such that our 100 volts adds with our 10 volt internal resistance voltage to equal our 110 volt source. The R1 voltage increases proportional to the current. It reaches a max value of 100 volts, such that the R100 volts and inductor 10 volts add to our source 110 volts. Use information from the graph to estimate the time at which the current through R1 and the current through R2 are equal. Our initial condition is therefore that the current through R1 is equal to the current through R2. Now we know that V equals IR, Ohm's law, so of course our current must equal V over R. We know our resistances from before, as we're given them here. As for our voltages, our voltage across R2 is just going to be our constant 110, which means we have all we need to use this equation to find what voltage across R1 at which our currents are going to be equal. Solving this for V1 by multiplying both sides by R1, putting our numbers in, gives me exactly 89.6 volts. Now to find our time that we're looking for, we just need to see on the graph at what time the voltage across R1, our V1, is 89.6 volts. Our 89.6 volts is just shy of our 90 right there, which puts our intersection roughly here, so roughly there, which looks to me to be about 1.15 seconds. Using information from the graph, calculate the value of the inductance L and internal resistance R of the non-ideal inductor. Let's start off with the resistance. The internal resistance is this resistor here, which is wired in the series with our R1 22.4 ohms. What we know is of course our R1 of 22.4 ohms. And we also know our voltages once the current has reached a steady state, 100 volts for our R1 and 10 volts for our internal resistance. So we have our resistance R1 of 22.4 ohms and at time equals 3 seconds, our voltage through R1 is 100 volts and our voltage through our capacitor is 10 volts, which is the voltage being consumed by our internal resistance. Now, to relate these together, we can recognize that the current through one must equal the current through the other because they are wired in series. And as we used above, our current is our voltage divided by resistance. We can solve that for our internal resistance by first multiplying out our resistances and then dividing both sides by V1. Putting our numbers in, gives me 2.24 ohms. Let's now find our inductance. To find this, we can use the time constant. For an RL circuit like the one we have, we can use this equation here. Where we have our tau, which is our time for a 63% change, our inductance that we're trying to find, and the resistance of our inductor branch. 
We can find our resistance by just adding R1 and our internal resistance together, giving me 24.64 ohms. And just a note, the reason we don't need to worry about our R2 resistor is because it's on a different parallel branch. Its supply of voltage is independent to the supply to our branch of the inductor. Next, we need to find what our time constant is. Now, recall that our time constant is the time for a 63% change. And so we see that our change in voltage for our inductor is 110 minus our final 10, which gives us 100 volts. 63% of that is just 63 volts. The voltage after a 63 volt change from our 110 is our 110 minus 63, which is 47 volts. So after our 63 volt drop, we're going to be at 47 volts, putting us pretty much at 0 0.5 seconds. We now have everything we need. Solving this equation here for our L, our inductance, we multiply both sides by R, Putting our numbers in, gives me 12.32 Henry to four significant figures. And we're done.